How do you start writing a comic book? I usually come up with a title first. But like this was last night, I got a email from a publisher friend of mine who says he's starting up a new comic and he has a color a cover illustration. Can I write a story in five pages <laughs> based on that cover illustration? So then I got to figure it out and figure it, figure it out. And there's certain things he wants in that story. I won't say what they are because maybe somebody else will run with the story. But certain story elements. So I got to figure out how to fit those story elements into a five-page story that includes the cover. When I write these stories for these magazines I regularly write for now, Shudder and Car uh, Vampirus Carmilla, frequently the artist will get a hold of a great cover painting that he wants to use. And he calls me up and says, can you write a story based on this cover? And sometimes the cover has a lot of image. You know, for instance, there was recently, he sent me one with a, it was a headsman, an executioner. And the headsman who was holding a certain kind of ax. And along, he was standing like on a, 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 a pillar or a mountain of skull, of human skulls. And there were a couple other things. Might have had a full moon or something. And it had a title. And the title wasn't some generic title that would fit, you know, like Curse of the Mummy will fit anything with a mummy in it. Blood of the Vampire will fit any vampire story. But this one had a very specific title that couldn't be changed because he needed a title for it to get in a, a certain catalog that distributes the magazines. So I had to come up with a story that came up with that executioner, that particular type of um, weapon he was using to cut the heads off. All those skulls, might have had a full moon too, if I can remember, and that title. So I sleep on it and mull it over when I'm walking around or driving a car or watching TV or something. I keep mulling those things around and sooner or later it comes together and then it comes up with a, a last panel. And the last panel in a horror story has to be a shock of some sort, a surprise. If you're doing a superhero story and it's an end, of, if it's a complete story in itself, you need an ending where everything is resolved, the, the bad guy is caught or whatever, you know. But if it's a continued story into the next issue, then it needs some kind of a shock or some kind of a surprise. All those things have to be taken into account. But what, to me, that's easy because that's where my strong points lay. What is the structure of a comic book? A structure, well, it's the first thing you have to remember is a comic book is visual. It can't be a bunch of talking heads. I mean, you can do it that way, but people are going to get bored with it. It needs to be visual. It's pictures. And the panels, there should be some kind of a... And not, a lot of artists can't do this. A lot of artists can only do nice like portraits and things and landscapes. But telling a story from one panel to the next, the continuity from one panel to the next, is a whole talent in itself and then the words the captions the, the the dialogue shouldn't repeat what you see in the picture you know I, I make the joke I saw a um, a a panel in a science fiction comic book once the picture showed a spaceship landing on a planet then there's a caption at the top of the panel that said as the spaceship lands on the planet, dot, dot, dot. And then if there's a dialogue balloon coming out of the spaceship, like somebody in the spaceship talking, we are landing on the planet, on our spaceship. You know, tr triple threat redundancy there. If you're landing on the planet, you don't have to say they're landing on the planet. And that's something um, a lot of writers don't know or, or can't figure out. When, when I was working for Russ Manning on Tarzan, he said, and, and I was making that mistake. I was being redundant in my panel. He said, no, 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 that's not the way you do it. And I learned a lot from Russ as, as far as writing comic books are concerned. He said, but he wanted the panels 
to be, quote, dense with information, unquote. So when you look at that panel, you're seeing the action, but something in the panel tells you something different in addition to what you're seeing in the action. Or in the dialogue, the dialogue will use a word or two. It's surprising when, in a, how much information you can put in one comic book panel. Just if, if a character is doing something, you can see what that character is doing something. You don't have to say it in the caption or have the character say what, it, what he or she is doing. But in the character's expression or body language, you can say a lot more. You can, you can, like they're doing this unwillingly, or they're being, you know, they're being forced to do it, or they're not taking it seriously. So you've already given a second piece of information, and if it's let's say a scene where there's mountains in the back, and the sun is setting, and it has whatever the character is doing something has something to do with light, like it's a vampire trying to get to his his coffin. If, you're, uh, as the sun's rising anyway, you're, you know that he's in a hurry because any minute the sun's going to come up and destroy him. So in that one panel, you can three three bits of information that are unrelated to each other. And, uh, and that's the way I like to do my stories. Do you use the same formula for every comic book? I, I'm doing the same format now for the, the ones I'm doing for Shudder and Vampirus Carmilla because they have, a, they have a house look. And the way I started, the ones I submitted, they were accepted with no problems. And the reason was, I just, when I first started out, I said, how do you want me to submit my stories? The Marvel style where you go to the artwork first or, or whatever. He said, just write a script, a full script. And that's what I do, and and they've been accepting everyone. They've been fine ever since. But if I was writing a, I did a graphic novel based on my movie Tales of Frankenstein, and I had five artists working on it, five different artists, and I asked each one, "How do you want me to do it?" With the exception of one, all of them wanted to do Marvel style. So what I did with them, I wrote a basic synopsis. I sent them the movie script that we shot for the film, and then I sent them some photographs of the actors playing those parts, and they did a beautiful job, a wonderful job. How much description do you write? Well, if you're writing, with a, writing a character that's well-known, like I have with Tarzan, Captain America, um, Vampirella, whoever. The, there's a house look. Everybody knows what they look like. I don't have to describe them at all. Sometimes um, I'll go into great detail if it's a if it's an unusual character, a strange hunchback with one eye or a peg leg and two colors hair or something. You know, then I'll, I'll describe all that if it's for a special purpose. At other times. Um, I'll just say, let's get some diversity in this story, make some people African-American, make some Caucasian, make some Asian, and let, let them just go wild with it. If there's certain kind of clothes, you know, like if it's a, uh, a sexy young woman, I'll say, have her wear, you know, like a mini skirt or shorts or a halter top, or, you know, something like that. Or if it's a Western story, I do a lot of Westerns that are horror stories, I'll say, um, you know, make sure that the guns don't look like a Hollywood gun. Or sometimes I make sure they do look like a Hollywood gun belt. Or in some cases, I've used historical figures. I love using historical characters. I've used Jesse James, Frank Nitti, uh, Wild Bill Hickok, Wyatt Earp. And I'll say, look up online, you'll see photos of the way they, were, the way they looked. So uh, sometimes the, the description is very precise. Sometimes it's very general. And sometimes it's non-existent, really. How do you keep the reader turning the page? That's a great question. And a lot of writers and artists don't know this either. And again, I learned this from Russ Manning. And when an artist changes the arrangement of my panels, I go, I go berserk. 
because their pages are designed to make you turn the page. The last panel on every right-hand page, you open the book up, and you have a right-hand page and a left-hand page. The right-hand page, the last panel, should either be something surprising, a shock, or a scene, a total scene change. So the whole page is about somebody out in the forest. The last panel is a castle. And then you go in your castle scene. Then makes them want to see what's on the next page. Or it's a the guy walking through the forest, and the last page is looking in terror. What is he in, what is he terrified about? You turn the page, it's a werewolf atta attacking him, lunging for him. Or it's simply a some, somebody, like in the story I just wrote, finished today, somebody's being stalked, and the last panel is them getting clubbed, close up, clubbed over the head. They don't know they're being stalked. Last panel is a close up, clubbed over the head from behind with a beer bottle and knocked out cold. Those are the ways you end the page. So it all has to fall on the right page. Yes, or it should, it ideally, should. but a lot of people don't do that. They don't know that. How do you write cliffhangers? A cliffhanger is just, when, when, in my younger years and when I was a kid, I saw a lot of old movie serials where at the end of the, everyone was like like 12 or 15 chapters long, and at the end of the chapter, the car goes off the cliff. Or um, a building, they get trapped in a building, the building explodes. And I wrote novels that way, using those types of cliffhangers. Of course, then you got to figure out how do you get your, you're going to get your hero out of those situations. And there was an old story that there was an, a writer who wrote pulp magazines who was a notorious drunk. And he would write the stories, and then he would, but he was always did the job. And there was this one thing where the hero got caught in quicksand. It was sinking in the quicksand. And these books were, these magazines were published like on a, a weekly or bi-weekly basis. And they were getting close to the deadline. And they didn't have an ending. They didn't know how the next story was going to begin and how he was going to get out of the quicksand. So the, the writer finally showed up and he was drunk out of his mind. And he walks, staggers into the office and he sits down behind a typewriter, puts a piece of paper in, cranks it up. And he starts typing and he types the whole chapter out. And then he walks out of the room, walks out of the office. So they went and they grabbed the story out of there because they're going to go to the printer and just <laughs> started off with him saying, after Buck got out of the quicksand and then he went into the rest of the story. So he never told you how he got out of it. And uh, that, I don't know if that's a true story, but it's a, a famous uh, a story that's been going around for decades with pulp writers. And I consider myself in many ways a pulp writer. But I um, I did a story once where the hero got locked in a safe at the end of the chapter. The next chapter, oh, then, the, then the, 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 the crooks come up to the safe who know the combination. They open up the safe and they f f shoot machine guns into the safe. That's how it ended. I had to find, figure out a way of getting him out of the safe. And there's the old cliche line, well, safes, it's a secret. Safes are meant to be broken, not to be broken into, not to be, uh, so you couldn't break into them, but not break out of them. But that wasn't good enough. So I have a friend in New Jersey <laughs> who used to be an escape artist. And I called him up, I got his, his voicemail, and I said, I'm not asking you to give me away any trade secrets, but I got my hero locked in a safe. How am I going to get him out of it so he doesn't get machine gun? The day went by, and then at 2 a.m., he's a real night owl, especially when you think it's three years later in, in New Jersey. I get this, I was screening my calls, and I get this voice laughing his head off. He couldn't control himself. And he, I finally, I knew what it was, so I picked up the phone, and he said, nobody here has ever asked me this question. Get a pencil, and this is how you do it. And, and in the story, I had the hero getting out of the safe. He goes, he, goes, he said, what brand is it? What, you know, and we figured, we worked all that out, 
So I ended up dedicating the novel to him. And I said to Jim Steranko, who told me how to get my hero out of the safe. And, and that's, uh, that's the way how I, how I worked out of out that cliffhanger. Usually I use the, in prose fiction, I use the standard ways they got out of them in the old movie serials. Jump out of the car at the last moment, you know, jump out of the window of the building before, just seconds before it blows up and that kind of thing. But, but the safe one was really, was really something. Sorry, just one last thing. Um, what is a pulp writer? Can you define that? Oh, a pulp writer was a writer who wrote for the old, had a little different meaning now, but originally had, um, was an, a writer who wrote for the pulp magazines. Usually very fast, very cheaply. He got paid maybe a, a penny or a half a cent a word or maybe a quarter of a cent a word, and he knocked these things out. They were really usually very lurid. They had very lurid covers. They had titles like Weird Tales, Black Mask Magazines, Startling Terror. I mean, things that comic books used years later. And the stories were always really improbable. But, you know, Tarzan and Fu Manchu, they all got their start in the pulp magazines. In later years, the pulp writers turned basically to paperbacks, and they wrote some of the early science fiction stories, and, but also things like Doc Savage, the, the Spider, The Shadow, and I've written a lot of Frankenstein novels, The New Adventures of Frankenstein. I wrote 12 of them, and they're always with a lot of action, a lot of mad scientists and pretty heroines and sadistic fiends and mad doctors and monsters. And um, so I consider myself a pulp, a pulp writer. In fact, I did one recent, in the last few years about a basically a masked character who put a mask on him called Jawbreaker. And he gets his name because he hits a crook and he says he broke my jaw. Hey, that's a good name for myself. That's where that name comes from. But he got into all the old kind of fights and chases and cliffhangers. How many written pages is a comic book? Well, comic books can be any length. In the old days, you, uh, most of the, the filler stories, like in action comics, you would have action. Superman would have the long story. And then in the back, it would be Zatara the Magician and Congo Bill, who was sort of like Jungle Jim, and Vigilante, who was a Western character. And they were usually about five pages long. Um, then they been expanded to like when I think when I was working a, a lot of writing a lot of stories for Marvel I think the stories were maybe 17 pages long when I worked at Gold Key the full length books were 25 pages long but the filler stories were 10 pages long the stories I'm writing now generally are the ones for Shudder and Vampiros Carmilla magazines and those even though some of the other writers writers write them in five pages. I write them in six pages. I found out with my own writing experience that six pages is ideal for telling a short horror story that has a surprise ending. The ones I was doing for Gold Key were the 10 pages. And thinking back now, I think they were probably a little bit longer than they needed to be. And I have a little bit of difficulty cramming everything in the five pages, even though I've done it for the same company because the artist only wanted to was available for five pages. But then we have what they call graphic novels that can be 60 some pages long and um, all done by the same writer and the same artist telling one long story. I've done some of those too. And, um, but I'm real comfortable now and have a really good time writing these six page horror stories. Can you clarify what you mean by pages? Yeah, by a page, I mean a printed page. What you see on the page when you buy the magazine. Um, so one comic book page of script might be half a page long, or it might be two pages long. It really just depends what you're trying to say and how much you have to describe. And sometimes you have a page with no dialogue for you're trying to make some kind of a dramatic point. So. It has more impact if you just show the artwork 
or maybe a sound effect here or there, and you can do that on a quarter of a page, you know, uh, panel one, long, wide shot of heroes fighting, panel two, tighter shot, panel three, close up, fist hitting face. You can do that in a, in a page or less. How long does it take you to write a comic book? The ones I'm writing now, the six pages, it takes me about three to four hours to do the first draft, which then I tinker with well, in the evening, adding a word, changing a word here and there. The next day I do a rewrite that usually takes me about two hours maximum. Then I let that sit and then I sleep on it. And if I come up with any ideas in the morning, sometimes I come up with a major idea, but usually it's just a word here and there or adding another panel or taking a panel out, something like that. So it's really a, you might say it's a three day process for a six page story, but most of the time I'm doing something else. And it's very little time is actually spent writing. So is it usually you come up with the title first or the cover art is given I to you? I usually, with these horror stories I've been doing, it's either one or the other, usually. There have been times where I've come up with an idea of, hey, let's use Jesse James in a story. And I don't know what the story is going to be or what the title is going to be or anything. I just know I've got to do some research on Jesse James. And then I find out all these things about his life and career. Hey, this will work in right... This will fit right in. Like I opened up the Billy the Kids, I mean the Wild Bill Hickok story, with him getting assassinated. The first panel, I got three panels at the top. This hasn't been published yet. Three panels at the top of him in Dodge in Deadwood, in the town of Deadwood, saying goodbye to uh, Calamity Jane, his girlfriend, and I gotta meet, I gotta go to this poker game, but be careful. She says, you know, remember your eyesight's starting to fail, I know. And so the big splash panel, which is that big panel you always see on the first page, it's Bill Hickok from the back sitting there and Jack McCall with ready to fire, you know, pulling the hammer back, ready to shoot him in the back of the head with with the dead man's hand he's holding. That's the way it opened. And then that went to a, him being zapped away by aliens. It's called the alien, angels, um, Aces and aliens, as opposed to aces and eight, aces and eights. So I, I thought of that scene of Wild Bill Hickok. Then I had to do some research on Wild Bill Hickok. I did one with Frank Nitty the other day, and uh, it's already out. I think it might be in the current issue, where Frank Nitty is being stalked by a vampire that he inadvertently caused, created, and he calls up Elliot Ness his main enemy with the untouchables to uh, help him get out of this jam. And Elliot Ness, who can't stand Frank Nitty, is no longer in the untouchable. He's already getting ready to leave for Pennsylvania, wherever he went. And um, I had to research all the stuff about Frank Nitty. All I knew was what I saw in the, the TV shows and in the movie. And uh, But I love doing that research. I love the stories where I can put in a a historical character that I have to do some looking up on. And those are what I get the most pleasure out of, the most satisfaction. But all in six pages. 